Okay. Are you ready? Everything is up. Yeah, everything's good now. Mic's on. Mm -hmm. Hey, take a breath. You're <laughs> working too hard. Can you email that to my boss? Who's your boss? Who's your boss? Kevin Osgood. You can just let him know. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Are we going? Yes. Hi, Zoom. My name is Adria Strohmeyer. I'm the Education Programs Manager here at the Door County Maritime Museum. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, big thank you to our sponsors, the Door County Medical Center. If you are in town for not fun reasons, they're your go-to people. If you're in town for fun reasons, big thank you to Bridgeport Resort. They are fantastic. To stay at right. Yeah. Did you like their room? That's awesome. Tonight we have Dr. Karen Murchie up from Chicago's Shed Aquarium. Dr. Murchie has done fish biology literally all over the world. We were talking about her time in the Bahamas earlier. Um, she's done research in the Arctic, the Amazon, Door County, which is why she's here tonight. She is in charge of freshwater conservation efforts in the Great Lakes region for the Shed Aquarium. She's also doing some interesting research, understanding how the human interaction with the climate is affecting migratory fish. And on that note, if I'm not sure if anybody's seen the Door County Advocate lately, but there's this walleye numbers at risk due to ice die off. And then down here, it says climate change puts more strain on prized Great Lakes fish. So that's interesting. Go ahead and give this article a read. Good stuff. Okay. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Murchie. Thank you, Andrea. Thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some fun stuff on the fish that I study and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Um, so fish migrations, oops, for me is a, is a natural fit to talk about um, because I've done a lot of migrations in my time. Uh, I grew up in Southern Ontario. Uh, so I have I grew up around the Great Lakes and uh, closer to Lake Erie, but actually pretty darn close to both Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Spent a lot of time outdoors, um, really loved that. Uh, and went to university. I initially thought I was gonna be an optometrist for my career. I'm glad that didn't happen. Um, I'm glad I became a biologist instead. It, for me, it was a, a really cool moment in particular. I, I decided in third year to do a field course in Jamaica. And um, that for me was like a turning point. It was the first time I had put on a mask and snorkel and snorkeled in warm waters. And um, this tiny little fish, half purple, half yellow, called a fairy basslet, um, befriended me and swam right in my mask and stayed with me that whole snorkel and I'm like those are so cool and that was it like literally I was like I'm not gonna do optometry I'm gonna be a fish biologist and then my fourth year of undergrad I had a cool opportunity to do an undergraduate thesis uh, in a fish lab where I was studying the swimming performance of juvenile rainbow trout with radio transmitters in them um, so radio transmitters uh, are one way that we use to track animals. Um, they're the same type of transmitters that are used for terrestrial animals. You get radio collars on bears and moose and all sorts of different things. You can also put radio transmitters on or in a fish as well and track them with the same kind of antenna. Um, it's just for the fish, then they've got this antenna that hangs out of their body or off the back of their body, wherever you put the tag. Um, so I was putting rainbow trout in a little swimming uh, tube to 
test how well they could sustain their swimming with different lakes of an antenna. So that was my introduction to the research side of fisheries. And then I did a master's where I was looking at um, young of the year yellow perch at the most northern range of their distribution in northern Alberta in Canada. And after my master's, I worked for the Canadian Federal Fisheries Agency in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Ontario. So kind of making my way around the Great Lakes, popping from the Lake Ontario, uh, Lake Erie region up to Lake Superior. There I had a lot of cool experiences, um, mostly working with brook trout and walleye on a river that had a hydroelectric facility. So understanding how uh, hydroelectricity um, being produced on rivers, how when they opened up um, and let more water go through the turbines as the demand for electricity peaks in the morning as we all get up, turn the lights on, plug in the coffee machine, hair dryers, etc. cetera. Um, we need more water going over the turbines to make more electricity to power everything. What does that, what's that experience like for fish downstream? Um, so I was putting in some transmitters in brook trout and walleye uh, on the Magpie River. And I know I'm on video, so I shouldn't move around as much. I don't think I have a pointer, but that middle row, the pretty picture with the river, that's the Magpie River near Wawa, Ontario. I spent a lot of time in a canoe uh, on that river tracking some fish. Um, it was a really cool experience. Um, then Sault Ste. Marie wasn't cold enough for me, apparently, so I moved up to the Northwest Territories, the highest yellow dot on that map, and uh, lived in Yellowknife um, and worked for an environmental consulting firm for a few years, uh, having tons of cool experiences, um, doing work at Canada's second uh, diamond mine, understanding before it went into production what might be um, some of the effects of the mine and, and getting some baseline data before the mine went in production. Um, also did some consulting work as well for the um, Canadian Federal Fisheries Agency doing some uh, Northern Pike um, fish passage studies in Saskatchewan. It's kind of doing lots of cool stuff. And that top row has some of the work that I was doing, um, sampling paraphyton, the slime that grows on the rocks um, in very, very, very cold water right after ice off in like June. Um, and then uh, that was me doing some plankton sampling and water sampling again. Uh, I think that was June and still getting snowed on, um, but really cool stuff. And uh, I knew after my master's, I always wanted to do a PhD, but I was really happy to have had some neat experiences working and figuring out, you know, where did I want to go? Like what direction with my PhD? Um, and the really cool opportunity came up to work on bonefish in the Bahamas. I was definitely ready to thaw out after being in the Northwest Territories for a bit. Um, so I was at a Canadian institution the furthest east uh, and north yellow dot in Ottawa, Ontario. But all my research was on an island in the Bahamas. And I was studying these really cool fish that are in the bottom picture, bonefish. Uh, they're benthic species, meaning they hang out near the bottom, but they are like some of the most prized sport fish. If you love to angle, that's like hunting and fishing in one because you have to stalk the flats. You have to be like really stealthy because if you cast your shadow the wrong way or if you know, in, in casting your um, little shrimp or crab pattern, uh, if it landed the wrong way, it could spook the bonefish and they'd take off. And part of the reason is the water is super clear, as you can see in the photo, but also bonefish have tons of predators, sharks, barracuda, dolphin, and then also osprey. So it really cool fish. I was understanding, uh, learning all sorts of aspects about their biology um, from where they go to spawn to how they make a living really in very dynamic environments. They come into tidal flats and mangrove creeks to feed at high tide. Um, the shallower water they can get into keeps them away from predators and 
then as the tide goes out, they have to move more offshore. So lots of tagging and tracking to understand their movements as well. Um, and then after my PhD, I did a really cool postdoc that was a real mishmash of things from continuing some work in the Bahamas. I went down to the Amazon to help some biologists take some giant migratory catfish. And I also um, started a project uh, with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, Ohio DNR and Michigan DNR to understand where walleye, uh, how much walleye were moving around Lake Huron and Lake Erie, as well as the Huron-Erie corridor. So in 2011, I was the sole surgeon to implant uh, transmitters and 400 uh, adult walleye for that study. And that's what that middle picture is, me uh, doing a surgery on a walleye to put uh, and a tracking device. And I mentioned radio tags earlier. These are acoustic tags. There's no antenna that hangs from them. They send out an acoustic signal to listening stations underwater. And as they swim by one of those listening stations, that fish uh, gets recorded. So keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to talking more about that. Um, then I ended up uh, as an assistant professor in the Bahamas. I moved to Grand Bahama and worked down there for five years. Um, it was an amazing experience teaching at like a liberal arts uh, college. You now was College of the Bahamas then. It's now called University of the Bahamas. Um, but I'm, all my family's still in Canada. I lost three family members in five years. I decided it was time to get closer to home. Cool job came up at Shed Aquarium um, for a migratory fish expert. And I was like, sign me up. And I got the job. And that brings us to where we are now. Um, so migratory fishes are really important around the world. Um, have so much connection to culture and um, people like understanding the timing of when fish migrate to certain areas. And it's no different in the Great Lakes. We have more than 50 species of migratory fishes in the Great Lakes, which is, is pretty awesome. And when we say um, migratory fish, that means they're needing to move from one area to another to satisfy some of their life history requirements. So maybe for a good feeding area, they need to make a movement to certain areas, but most common is needing to change habitats for reproduction, finding suitable areas to uh, spawn where their offspring are gonna be successful. So um, why migratory fishes are so important is because when they get to these areas to reproduce, that's, that's the way it sustains the fish populations. And in the Great Lakes, if you account for um, commercial, recreational, and tribal fisheries, that's a, a $7 billion a year industry in the Great Lakes. Um, so really important aspect. And around the Great Lakes too, we often celebrate uh, a lot of these migratory fishes. Sometimes they're school mascots. You have uh, a lot of businesses that are focused around the fisheries. And these are things that we can see. Um, I know I'm, I'm in a crowd with people in Door County so that you know what it's like um, to have fish and fishing as part of your everyday fabric um, celebrations as well. And I really, I. Again, sort of depending on who I'm talking to, some people would really be surprised of how many people come to the Great Lakes to recreate uh, and, and get out fishing. And that's really a big way that people interact with the fish. And it's really important to the economy as well in terms of supplying jobs. So more than 75,000 people are employed around the Great Lakes in uh, jobs that support fish and fishing. What we might not think about as often too is how much fishing is tied to food security. Um, so we have a lot of choices for protein options. Uh, you know, you can go to the store and buy chicken or beef or whatever, um, but uh, fish is an important protein as well in the Great Lakes. And I think um, there's been some really interesting studies um, more recently, one done in Wisconsin looking at 
uh, how many people were fishing for food and the numbers are going up. Um, it's not just for fun anymore, but a lot of times it's also putting food on the table and not just the occasional fish meal, but that's um, becoming something people are really relying on. And I know from around the Chicago region too, particularly during COVID, we were seeing a lot more people out angling, you know, partly maybe for some stress relief, but also a lot of people fishing uh, for food as well. So I think that's something that we can think of as well. Um, and then cultural connections, uh, tribes have relied on fish and fisheries, having a, a relationship um, as well with the fish. And again, just I mentioned some cultural celebrations. The, the Friday night fish fry is a, a really big deal. And again, think of how that brings people together um, to celebrate and connect over fish. Can yeah. I interrupt for a second? Sure. How many of you eat fish on the Friday night fish fry? Anybody or, here mm -hmm. eat fish on Friday? Often on. Often on? Yeah. Oh, right. That's what I thought. Yeah. Just a second. And when I come up here, I often partake in some Friday night fish fry myself. So um, I love plugging my dog into presentations. That's my dog, BG. Um, so uh, a little bit of like uh, introducing some threats to our migratory fish. Um, these are pretty common throughout the world. It's not unique to the Great Lakes, but anything that is a barrier um, blocking fish from where they need to go uh, can be a challenge, right? If they can't get to their migratory grounds, that is not great news for reproduction. So around the Great Lakes, there's over 275,000 barriers. It might actually be even more now from when this map was produced. Um, a lot of the times when people think of barriers, we think of big dams, right? Um, big hydroelectric dams. Uh, and those absolutely are barriers that can stop fish from getting to where they need to go. Sometimes they have um, like fish ladders or other types of passage to allow them to get upstream. Um, but even more common around the Great Lakes are culverts. So anytime we have a roadway that crosses over a stream, we're not gonna build a bridge over it, but instead we put culverts under the roadway to allow the water to pass through and ideally the fish can pass as well. Um, but over time, uh, sometimes these culverts become not passable anymore. And that's because if you think of, um, there's different types of culverts, the corrugated steel culvert is like in this picture here on the bottom is very common, um, but there's also the very large concrete box culvert. Um, lots of examples of both of these around Door County. Um, but you think, in a normal winter, not this one so much, but you have, uh, at this time of the year, we'd normally have a lot of snow melting and then we'd start to get rain. All that water starting to go into the creek, all of a sudden means there's a lot more flow. And if you've got a pipe like this and you have a lot of water trying to get through it, that increased velocity through the pipe means downstream, you might be scouring away some of the substrate or what's the bottom material. Um, and over time, many years with a, a big uh, spring freshet, as it's called when the snow melts and you get rain, um, you might have all that scouring. And now your pipe that was level with the bottom of the creek is now sitting up here and you've got a bit of a waterfall. For some fish that are really good swimmers, maybe they could jump up through the little waterfall and keep going upstream. Um, but some of the little minnows uh, and some fish that aren't as good as swimmers, that might be a complete barrier. That means they can't access the habitat upstream, which is maybe really good habitat for spawning um, as well. So these are some things that um, we think about for challenges to migratory fish. And then another big one is climate change. So Andrea just read some high, highlights from a, a newspaper that talk about climate change. The majority of fish in the world, um, their body temperature is the same as the water temperature. There's only a few uh, fish that actually generate their own body. Otherwise the fish, their body temperature is 
people to the water they're swimming in. And all the physiology of the fish is very well connected to temperature. It's like the master factor that controls what's going on. Um, warmer water means the fish's heart rate is going faster because it needs to um, pump more blood that contains more oxygen to get it going around. In cooler water, their metabolism slows down. They don't have, there's more oxygen in the water. They don't have to um, breathe as much. So, and then that also means too, in terms of reproduction, um, temperature is a big factor because they might be like, okay, um, at a certain temperature, it's time for me to move from one habitat into this next one to spawn because there's very certain conditions that allow their eggs um, to be viable and, and timing of the hatch and everything's really important. So what happens if we get warmer and warmer water, um, the fish might have to go make their movements into uh, a location earlier. Maybe that's gonna work out okay, but other parts of the food web are, are not ready for it. And I'll, I'll get into some of the work more specifically um, that I'm looking at and, and how climate change um, could be connected uh, with these guys, suckers. I got you in the room and now I'm only gonna talk about suckers. So <laughs> if you were hoping to hear about Wally and Lake Whitefish and so on, sorry. Um, these, are, these are the fish that I work with. Um, they are really awesome and they're found all around Door County. Uh, and they are in the Great Lakes, our most abundant group of migratory fishes, both by numbers and biomass, probably. In all five of the Great Lakes, you will find suckers, um, white suckers being the absolute most abundant, and longnose suckers um, as well. There's other species of suckers, and we can get into talking about the red horses and, and so on. But these are my main um, species of focus. And they're really, really, really cool animals. But I can't just go out to a store and buy a t-shirt or a hat with suckers on them. They're not fish that people tend to angle for with a, a rod and reel. Um, they are considered native non-game fish. So fish that people don't tend to fish for. But they're really, really cool. And they make these incredible migrations in the springtime. Um, and uh, I'll tell you why they're so important. So picture this is the time of the year when things start to happen and, and we start to lead up to the sucker migration. So this is a photo from Big Creek right here in Sturgeon Bay. Um, so I've had an unusual winter. You've got uh, right now some snow starting to melt, get some of the uh, early rains leading up to spring and it turns this beautiful creek from a quiet sleepy uh, little system to you know starting to hear an increase in the sound of the water uh, and um, all of a sudden we have the water temperature being just the right temperature to cue the suckers to start moving upstream into these tributaries. And so these are some suckers in another tributary, uh, Samuelson Creek, also in Dora County. And so the sucker migration starts with a few individuals. These are some really cute white suckers. And then a few more start to come in, also white suckers here, until it's a party. These are now long no suckers. This is Pines Creek up closer to Bailey's Harbor. But in small tributaries, you can get thousands to tens of thousands to even in some larger rivers um, up in Superior. Uh, there's been some really cool work done where they've had over 100,000 suckers that they've documented in some rivers. And they are there to spawn. And it really is a party. Um, so what it looks like when you have spawning suckers is that you've got usually one female. These are long nose suckers. Um, so the, the female is more drab. She's in the middle. And then we've got three male suckers that have that nice red bar down their side, uh, gathering and kind of jockeying for position to be as close to the female as possible. 
she'll start to vibrate her body and the tails are really quivering and then the males start quivering as well. She's releasing the eggs, the males release the sperm and it's external fertilization. The eggs are mildly adhesive. Um, so when they fall, they'll settle between the rocks and gravel. Um, but a lot of times too, with the flow, you'll still get some uh, eggs drifting downstream. So ultimately, a lot of the times too, the suckers try to get fairly far upstream so their eggs don't become vulnerable to getting totally washed right out back into um, the big waters of the lake uh, where they could get sedimented or, or eaten by more predators. Um, but it, it's quite quite a spectacle, um, and especially in really shallow waters like Big Creek and so on too, you can really see often the fish with their backs sometimes out of the water in lower uh, water years, and you hear all this splashing going on. Um, so it, it's really cool. And aside from the fact that they're re reproducing, um, again, to sustain their population, there's this whole other aspect that's really cool with the suckers. And when they're in the creeks, the eggs and sperm are adding things like nitrogen and phosphorus that you'd find in fertilizer to the creek. And that's really cool at this time of the year because there hasn't been a lot of nutrient input into the tributaries over the winter. So this basically kickstarts the food web. It gives a buffet of nutrients to the little aquatic insect larvae that live in the creeks things like caddisfly larva, dragonfly larva, um, mosquito larva, all sorts of larva that are in the creek. Um, and there was a cool study done a number of years ago out of UW-Madison. They blocked a stretch of creek where the suckers were and measured the nitrogen and phosphorus and traced it directly into the, the caddisfly larva. And where the suckers were, the caddisfly larva grew 12% bigger than in the sections where there were no suckers, the algae grew 50% faster. So it really is kickstarting the food web at a really critical time. And uh, those aquatic insects, um, trout really love to eat the insect larva. So I say uh, too, if you love trout, you should thank a sucker um, because also a lot of trout will gorge themselves on sucker eggs as well. Um, which is really cool. And the little aquatic insects, if they don't get eaten by the fish, they hatch and then they are flying around and become food for birds and bats. So also if you like birds and bats, you should thank a sucker. Um, they're pretty cool. And the, uh, the larva and the younger suckers are important food for a lot of the fish that people love to catch. And a lot of the times too, even while the fish are in the tributary spawning, they can be, the adults are um, sometimes food for eagles and osprey. Um, seeing uh, up in Fish Creek, osprey take suckers out of the creek. And um, uh, in Decorah, Iowa, they uh, have this really cool monitoring program for eagles and ospreys and they have cameras in the nest. And a couple of years ago, I. Uh, I heard from one of the folks that works at this raptor resources program. They're like, hey, we understand you know something about suckers. We're seeing these suckers show up in our eagle and osprey nests at this particular time. And I'm like, yeah, that's because they're migrating and they're in shallower water and easier for the eagles and osprey to pick off. And it's pretty cool then that they're bringing them to the nest for their offspring. So really important ecological role that these fish are providing. So yeah, a lot of the work that um, has been done on fish in the Great Lakes has really focused on species that have commercial and recreational significance and a bit less so on fish that are considered non-game like suckers. So there's a lot of really big information gaps on just some basic aspects about their life history. What cues them into the creeks? Where are they outside of spawning season? So many things that we know more about walleye and whitefish and so on, um, but we have these gaps in, in our suckers. Um, so that's where I'm at of trying to fill some of these gaps. 
So um, I've got across three states, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan, volunteers uh, out peaking in creeks uh, along the western shore of Lake Michigan. And now I've got a couple of stations on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan as well, um, where folks will help me figure out when suckers show up to the tributary that they're monitoring. And so um, right now, I've been working my way up from Chicago up to Door County, installing stations um, where the volunteers will go to, um, probably starting next week uh, to start looking for the suckers because they're probably going to come earlier this year because the water temperature is already warming up quite a bit. And this is really going to help me again um, figure out. I've got data loggers um, recording water temperature every 15 minutes. Uh, loggers are also getting water depth, which is a proxy for flow to see what is it that they're queuing into. Uh, and again, over time, monitoring the same locations year after year, we can look at, to see whether we're seeing any shifts on uh, the migration. And, and even just documenting how, to, how long does a, a spawning run last? Um, how long does it take to get to the peak of the spawning run? Um, it's really cool to have volunteers just using their eyes. They don't get in the creek, they show up with some polarized sunglasses and do this. Are the suckers there? Yes or no. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's a really cool aspect to document the migration phenology. Um, then another part of the study that I'm looking at as well is, does the same sucker come back to the same tributary year after year to spawn? And that is important to understand because these fish don't spawn and die like Pacific salmon do. These fish can spawn once they've reached sexual maturity around three or four years of age, then they're able, if they get enough resources during the year that they can allocate to making eggs or sperm, um, along with still maintaining their, their body size, um, then they could go back uh, in every year to spawn. And why that would be important to understand is if something happened to say Big Creek where the fish couldn't get it upstream anymore for some reason, um, what would that do? If the fish typically go back to the same location year after year, would they just turn back and go into the lake and they'd be like, mm, I guess that's it, I'm not spawning this year, what would happen? Um, so using little microchips, the same, anybody have a dog or a cat at home that's microchipped? Yeah, anyone? Yeah, they're, they're small little tags. Um, they're inexpensive, despite how much maybe you get charged at the vet to put one in. Um, they're only like a few dollars a piece. They're really small. There's no battery in them. Um, if anyone has a transponder for their car, uh, as they go on tollways, it works the same way. When you um, pass a tag by an antenna, a little electromagnetic switch turns on and the unique ID of that tag is read and you get the tag ID, the date and the time. Um, so back in 2017 and 2018, uh, between those years, I take 300 white suckers um, uh, equal split of sex, both males and females, to see do the same fish come back to the same tributary year after year. And I'll keep you on that cliffhanger, and then we'll get to the results. For you. Oh, pig tag means passive integrated technology. Thank you, Michaela. I'm also um, using some other neat technology of just putting underwater microphones out to listen to what does it sound like when fish are spawning, uh, you know, underwater. Um, so a lot of the times uh, ecoacoustics have been used around coral reefs or out to listen to whales and dolphins. You can listen for the sounds that animals make. Um, there are some fish uh, like freshwater drum that make vocalizations too in the Great Lakes. This is sort of a, a newer tool to be used in freshwater systems. And I was getting cool GoPro footage of the sucker spawning and I could hear, you know, while they were all beating their tails vigorously, the, the sound of the sand and the gravel just like moving 
I was like, that'd be really cool to put a microphone out and record the spawning sounds for both long nose and white suckers and see if I could distinguish, do they have a different amplitude in the, in the sound? Is the duration of the spawning event different? Could we in a very um, deep and more turbid or uh, river that looks more like chocolate milk, could we put a microphone out and listen for when the suckers show up to spawn? So that's another aspect I've been doing. And then um, similar to the walleye study where we put acoustic transmitters in walleye uh, in 2022, um, I implanted with the, the help of um, US Fish and Wildlife Service in Green Bay, Wisconsin Sea Grant and, uh, and the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in terms of funding this project, we implanted 60 white suckers to figure out where are they outside of the spawning season. Um, so all of this information is really to fill knowledge gaps and our understanding about these species and be able to have that uh, information go to resource managers to, to share what we're learning and how we can continue to make sure there's populations of these common fishes. We want to keep them common. So what have we seen so far? So starting with the, the volunteer driven aspect of my migration phenology. It is, we're into year eight of utilizing volunteers to monitor sites across Illinois, Wisconsin, and some up on Lake Superior as well. And it is an amazing um, connection because there's only one of me and lots of not me. So I can only be in one place at a time, but having this network of volunteers checking in on all these tributaries, I have eyes out and people are simultaneously monitoring a number of locations and I can learn. And I've seen over the time, South Milwaukee tends to be my first tributary that kicks off. Kiwani River is pretty close in time to that because it's a, a bigger, deeper uh, river and tends to warm up and is less subject to um, fluctuations in weather. And just having sort of this knowledge of like the timing of when things kick off and, and when we can expect other tributaries is really awesome. So we're getting tons of data collected there. I'm working on analyzing the past seven years worth of data. And it looks like we've revealed a, a new temperature um, for when the suckers are queuing in. That's actually pretty standard across that latitudinal gradient. I have sites just north of Chicago through Highland Park all through Dower County and some uh, sites up in the UP. And it's um, pretty consistent across the board. So that's something that's really cool. A lot of the times as a biologist, we might pick a couple of locations to study, not like 14 or 50, but this is, I've got um, that data from that many sites because of the power of volunteers. Also um, with my volunteers, they are absolute amazing ambassadors for the program and for these species. Because if you see somebody at a bridge doing this and you're walking past with your dog, at least if you're anything like me, you're a little curious. You want to know, what are they looking at? So you might be walking your dog and you're like, hey, what are you looking at? Oh, I'm looking at suckers. Why suckers? And this whole conversation starts up of like why they're participating in this program, why suckers are so cool. And uh, it's really great. I have a number of anglers as well that are participating in this. And it is also really awesome because some of them are like, wow, I always came out here to fish for steelhead and I'd see suckers and they were kind of annoying. Like if I catch one of them instead of the steelhead, now I know how important suckers are for the ecology of this creek and how all these other species are connected to suckers so they can tell their friends. And that's better than hearing from me because they're hearing from their friend who's out there and experiencing these cool things and learning more about suckers. Um, so it's been a super awesome component and of course, if we're trying to look at the impacts of climate change and whether we're seeing shifts, this is a very long-term study. So I mentioned this is 2024 is year eight of me doing this work, um, but I have 
volunteers that were with me from the first year in 2017 still um, engaged. So they're really enjoying it. And, uh, it's an awesome part of the program. As far as the spawning site fidelity, we have very high returns of the suckers year after year to the same creek. So after the, um, the 300 tag between 2017 and 18, we had 204 suckers come back in 2019, then 176, 167, then 143, and, and then back up again. And so it's like, a really, anytime you talk to other biologists and you're like, yeah, I've had like this amazing tag return, they're like, really, that's impressive. So um, that means too, in these tributaries, yeah, we, we want to make sure that um, culverts are maintained, that they're passable so the fish can get to where they're going. Also means too that, you know, if, if people are harvesting suckers, um, what does that mean for that tributary? If you were to remove a lot of individuals, it might take a long time for other suckers to start coming back and using that creek. There is some literature that's been done looking at the olfactory nerves of really tiny larval suckers to determine, are those little babies imprinting on the creek that they were born in? And it looks like the olfactory nerves might be sensitive enough or developed enough at the time before they out migrate to the lake that they might be queuing in. But I think there's still some research to be done on that, um, but it's pretty cool. In terms of, oh, that one picture at the top, that's one of my antennas sitting in the creek that the fish that have their tags in it, as long as they're by the antenna, um, it picks it up and then it records that information of the date and time that they were there. Um, they actually really like to hang out by my antennas, which is really convenient. Um, as far as the uh, microphone and the spawning sounds, you know, we're definitely getting some really cool results. Um, I wish there was more of me to help analyze all this data. Um, I had to learn a new software called Raven Pro. It's uh, developed by Cornell University. A lot of it's been done um, to track bird sounds. And if anyone has um, the really cool app by Cornell on their phone, I'm blanking on the name right now. I have it on my phone. Merlin, Merlin oh, thank yeah. you. All the, the very um, unique patterns of the, the sounds of the bird calls you know, it's mapped out in software like that. And then, so it uses that kind of algorithm when you're listening to match it up to that same kind of trace. So this is what a trace of the, um, for the spectrogram and waveform of what sucker spawning looks like. Starts out a little bit quieter and then you hit the crescendo and then it decreases. So it kind of sounds, if anyone's heard of one of those rain sticks, it's like, I don't know, I. I can't make that noise without embarrassing myself. Yeah, you, know, you turn it over and it's, yeah, sounds, sounds quiet and then loud and then quiet again, which you get the gist of there, which is really cool. I mentioned in uh, 2022, we kicked off the um, spawning or the acoustic telemetry study of the white suckers over here and how it works to be able to pick up where the fish go outside of the tributary, they have to have a, a listening station to swim past. So what's really cool and a real amazing aspect of the Great Lakes is across a bunch of states, as well as um, in Ontario as well, we have collaboration amongst state, provincial, federal, academic, non-academic agencies or like non-governmental agencies working together to share resources. Every yellow dot on the Great Lakes is a listening station. So across all of Lake Erie, all of Lake Huron, um, some of Lake Michigan, all, and all of Lake Ontario, some of Lake Michigan, some of Lake Superior, and new into the St. Lawrence Seaway. We've got a lot of listening stations. So whether we have a tag walleye 
sturgeon, lake white fish, white sucker, smallmouth bass, swim by one of those listening stations. They're a little bit bigger than my water bottle, but essentially they're out there. And if a fish swims by, it's sending a signal from the tag that gets picked up by the listening station. It's like, I'm tag number 427389 at this date and time. And that information sits in that listening station until a researcher pulls that out of the water, downloads it, and uploads it into a database. So I can look, search that database for my tag suckers, folks out of UW Stevens Point that are doing work on smallmouth bass and lake whitefish and walleye. They can search that database for their tagged fish and so on. And it's really, really cool. And uh, what we've seen so far, um, I'll be giving a more detailed talk of the findings of the telemetry stuff at a fish tales talk next month, April 11th at Crossroads, if you want to hear more of what we're finding. But the short note, fish tagged in 2022, we had 60 of them. Um, we were still tracking 50 of them into 2023, 44 of the 60 that were tagged came back to spawn. And even though all the individuals were tagged together, they didn't stay together throughout the year. Some left out of the Sturgeon Bay Canal and went into the deeper waters of Lake Michigan where we don't have any listening stations. So we don't know how far they went. They didn't go all the way over to Traverse Bay because there's listening stations there and none were picked up there. They have picked up um, Lake Sturgeon from over in Green Bay all the way over there. Um, but then we've also had a lot of the suckers stay in Sturgeon Bay area. Some have gone into Green Bay as well. But what was neat, even the ones that left out of the Sturgeon Bay Canal and some that went into Green Bay all came back then in 2023 back to the creek to spawn, which is really cool. And these tags last for three years. So we'll see what happens this year. And I only get the information uh, at the end of the year after all the um, stations have been downloaded and the information's in the database. Um, so it's like, you have to kind of wait and I want to know what are all my little fish friends doing, um, but it's neat to then start to put the story together of where they've been, but we'll really have a, a good full picture after three years, um, but it's super exciting. We're learning so much more uh, about the fish through this tagging and tracking than we could have ever known before. And I know I'm starting to get close to my time, I'll leave time for questions, but there's a, a couple other things I wanted to um, mention in this talk. Um, last year, the Great Lakes were designated as a hope spot with the organization Mission Blue, which has had a focus um, particularly on ocean conservation. Dr. Sylvia Earle was an amazing ocean explorer. She's referred to as her deepness. Um, she is very passionate about um, the ocean and um, protecting habitats and fish and, um, and really caring. She came to shed in two, yeah, 2022, that's right, and gave a talk and she was like, oh, it'd be really, I think we should start including some freshwater locations as hope spots. Even though Mission Blue is only ever focused on the ocean, she sort of challenged to shed, maybe you should nominate Lake Michigan as our first freshwater hope spot. And we thought, well, we're gonna take that challenge and why would we only nominate we Lake Michigan? Running. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah, so when she, when she suggests something, it's great idea to jump on if she's like you know nominate a great lake for my organization like absolutely so we nominated all the great lakes um as hope spots they're they're amazing treasures that we get to live on and um i love the opportunity so at last year in may of 2023 um the great lakes became the first freshwater hope spot and i think what's really cool and now all these people who are very plugged in for caring for the oceans 
they're now exposed to some new messaging that says, if I care about what's happening in the oceans, I really need to care about what's happening upstream too. Water doesn't stay in one place. Think about the Great Lakes and how it flows out through the St. Lawrence into the Atlantic. It's, it's all connected. And so I think this is a, a really neat opportunity that we have to connect the audience that Dr. Sylvia Earle has um, through her Mission Blue to how awesome the Great Lakes are. We, we have a lot more to do to get people interested in fresh water and the animals that live in it. So I, I think that's really cool. Um, where I work at Shed Aquarium, we're turning 100 in 2030. And I never thought as a fisheries biologist, I'd have an opportunity to um, help guide some of the direction of uh, new galleries um, that are coming up at Shed, but I'm really excited that there's going to be some cool sucker interactives. There's going to be um, an exhibit that highlights this amazing collaboration of researchers around the Great Lakes through the GLaDOS, the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, where we're tracking all these different species of fish and what we're learning about their movements. Um, so a, a small plug uh, for making sure you get to back to the Shed Aquarium, uh, if not earlier, um, but definitely by 2030 to see some of the cool stuff that we're doing. And then lastly, um, I know you guys live right here on one of the Great Lakes, but last year I had this cool opportunity to uh, do a cruise, a Smithsonian cruise on the Great Lakes. And uh, it was last October, we're doing it again this August, end of August into early September, we start in Toronto and make our way through for the Great Lakes. We we're up by the St. Mary's River, uh, not quite into Lake Superior. We're getting some superior water. Um, but if you're interested in joining Shed and the Smithsonian on a, a Great Lakes cruise, um, let me know. I'll get you some information. It was such a cool experience for me. So even though I grew up in Ontario and close to Lake Ontario and Lake Erie and having had a lot of experience there. And then I lived in Sault Ste. Marie and working on Superior. It was just such a neat experience for me to go through all those great lakes by boat and see them with a, a different lens. Um, Cause otherwise most of the time I've been closer to shore but not out like in the, main deeper waters and it was it was a really neat adventure at each of the different stops there's different excursions from like um, going out to check out Niagara Falls up in Perry Sound when I was 17 years old I was a, a junior ranger at a provincial park that's one of the excursions too which is like it's really trippy that I am going to all these locations that through different parts of my life I have a connection to um, but it's super cool I get out by Manitoulin Island, um, Mackinac Island, and then end in Milwaukee. So a short plug for that. And with that, thank you so much for your time. That's my email. I'll take questions. But boy, I can talk. <laughs> so is there any questions for Dr. Before I start asking all of them, also the antenna, you mentioned two tags, yeah. which were inserted, but also antenna. Does that affect the predators uh, getting at them or? Yeah, so um, so the, an the radio tags are the ones that have an antenna that trail um, from them. They're, they're still used in, in freshwater research, but most people have gone to these acoustic tags that have no antenna. Um, more the reason is because there's that awesome infrastructure of all these listening stations. With the radio and tags, um, the tag itself is sending a signal through the antenna. Then you're up on land with a big antenna that you can listen with. It works well in shallower environments, um, but the deeper the fish might go, um, the radio signal attenuates in deeper water and might not carry as well. 
Um, so most people have switched to just using the acoustic transmitter. Uh, so there's nothing um, that's outside of the body of the fish um, at all. So a lot of times we do still mark the fish with an external tag, um, a Floyd tag or a loop tag. And that's done partly too. So if, um, say somebody's doing a, a, the DNR or Fish and Wildlife Service are doing a gill nuts um, survey, uh, if they happen to catch a fish, you wouldn't know that it has an acoustic tag in it because where the um, surgery was and the sutures were, that disappears really quick and you wouldn't know. But a, an external tag helps them flag, hey, this fish has an acoustic transmitter in it, so make sure it gets back in the water. Um, but ultimately, with any kind of tagging and tracking studies, the individuals we tag, we want to make sure they're healthy, they're doing well. We've done everything from the capture to the tagging and release that minimizes the stress because the information that individual fish gives us, we're making assumptions that it's behaving like all of its friends that are out there swimming around. So um, again, we're seeing like lots of great study with you know, the fish um, swimming around for many years, getting this information for us. So it's really cool. Yes. Are the listing stations in the county? Yes. So uh, I can bring up that map again. Um, I can actually, I am on the internet. So I can pull up a map and get more granular. What was the, um, the piece of equipment that was out here by the purpose? Oh, one of the listening stations. Yeah. I'll have her put it back up and I said, like, hey, that's the permit. I know that boat. So this is the this is the GLaDOS database. Anybody can go to the GLaDOS website. So if you just type in G L A T O S search that, this is what you get. You have to be one of the researchers to get into the more granular um, aspects. Uh, so only, only somebody that's doing the work could drill in more. But here, just to, to see how much we have listening stations. Um, the work on the St. Lawrence, a lot of these are more for understanding movements of American eels through the St. Lawrence from um, uh, Lake Ontario uh, out the St. Lawrence and into the Atlantic. They go spawn out at the Sargasso Sea. Um, and then I guess getting over to Green Bay area. Oops. Every eight kilometers, sorry, but I speak in kilometers and not miles. Every eight kilometers, there's a, a listening station there's some areas where there's um, a bit more of a concentration of them. Uh, sometimes that's to ask more specific questions uh, related to the species of being studied. Here we are um, in terms of Sturgeon Bay. We've got a curtain of receivers out at the mouth of Sturgeon Bay into Green Bay. So we make sure if fish are leaving Sturgeon Bay that we can pick them up um, and then through Sturgeon Bay and out the Sturgeon Bay Canal. This summer, we're gonna have all along um, the side of the Door County Peninsula, we're getting more receivers. Fish and Wildlife Service, UW Stevens Point, US Geological Survey, researchers from um, University of Michigan, or sorry, Michigan State University, uh, and, and all over are invested in um, doing a lot of studies on like whitefish, walleye, suckers. <laughs> so having the listening stations uh, on the eastern side of the peninsula is gonna afford us, you know, hear where those pegged fish go. Um, and I'm really excited as well because this will give an opportunity for me to start answering some other types of questions of like, what are the long nose suckers doing potentially putting acoustic transmitters uh, and some of those fish that might be swimming out um, directly into the big waters of Lake Michigan. So.
So it's really cool. So anybody, yeah, again, you can go on this website, you can um, see the different types of projects. Any of the ones um, that are in Green Bay tend to have um, the GB thing here so we can get in um, all that. Get into some of the, um, well, that's the map. Here's the projects. So for Lake Michigan, if you wanted to learn more about um, the Green Bay Lake Whitefish study, there's a project description there. And so even some of the projects that have started and have finished, that information's there. Um, you can get in and read more about um, the smallmouth bass work too that's being done. Um, and, and then there's some really cool stuff that's happening in other lakes you might be interested to learn about. So it, it's, a, it's a cool resource. Yes. Yeah, I noticed on the map there's not a lot of listed stations like the urban areas around Lake Michigan on the southern portion. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, we started um, doing some work from Shed in, uh, in the Chicago River. We put some uh, transmitters last year and 80 fish in the Chicago River. Um, right now, we're trying to understand, we're doing some um, habitat augmentation because you can't really do too much in a very channelized, you know, everything's uh, got like this corrugated steel wall. Um, so to kind of add habitat back into the Chicago River, we've been putting in artificial floating wetlands and we're really curious how the fish are responding to them. Artificial wetlands in the rivers, originally the whole idea was like, okay, we'll put these plants in there. The plants will suck up pollutants and nutrients uh, out of the river and concentrate them in the plants. And so that's where these floating wetlands came in more of a nutrient abatement uh, idea, but it's like, Yo, it's really cool to do that because not only can you remove some nutrients out of these uh, urban rivers, but you also are now creating habitat where there was no habitat before. Top side, you can see turtles using these, uh, wetlands, uh, waterfowl, depending on what plants you're putting in, butterflies being attracted to it. But at Shed, then we're focused on the aquatic animals. We're like, how are the fish using these habitats? So um, we've had a biologist that's studying on the Chicago River and he started to put out larval fish traps that have like a little glow stick in the middle um, and the larval fish would be attracted to the lake. So we were seeing around these floating wetlands um, that there were larval fish. So that indicates that some of the fish might have been using the roots as spawning habitat. But then also... Now we're putting acoustic transmitters in too to see how are the adults using. Are they also maybe coming in um, to use these areas as feeding habitats? So um, yeah, I think there's there's definitely more opportunities. Anytime you have these listening stations out, it also like requires somebody to maintain them, pull them up, and download them. Uh, and there's a cost, but definitely the more people that are sort of interested in collaborating on on projects in a particular area. That's um, how this infrastructure really gets put in place. And initially, again, with the lake here on Lake Erie walleye question, that, that's like the big fishery there. So that's where initially, if you were to look at this map back in 2011, you'd only have like a few um, receivers in a different, very strategic places, uh, a row across Saginaw Bay, like a couple, bands going from one side to the other, more of like gates and curtains. But that you really only kind of get some directional flow, but really to understand where the fish are and where they aren't having a grid more evenly spaced is uh, sort of the best approach. But again, that takes time. That takes a big investment from um, the research and um, resource management community around the Great Lakes to put that infrastructure in place and then be able to maintain it. Yeah. What's the average migratory distance for a sucker? Uh, don't know yet. <laughs> we're, okay. we're still learning. I think it's, uh, I'd feel better uh, 
be answering that maybe in another two years of of seeing like how much they're moving. Um, so, so they, but right now, what, what, what's the furthest you had one move? So the furthest so far, gosh, up by um, Fish Creek from Sturgeon Bay. But I don't know if they've swam outside into the big waters of Lake Michigan where they've gone to. But that might be like the furthest distance. But if you start to add up all like the movements around here and there, what that looks like. Um, I've, I've gotten into the data, but not like in, into the data. Because really, I just got everything in December and uh, I've done a first pass of looking at it. Um, but it's interesting, just like humans, you've got a variety in the individuals, like some people are homebodies, some are movers. So similarly for fish, whether you're talking about fish out in the ocean versus fish in the Great Lakes, you're going to see some individual variability in, in how much they move and um, how far they go, which is also pretty neat. There's a, there, there's a lot that we're learning. No, we're over Is seven. Kankakee River too far away from you? Kankakee River? Kankakee River's a bit further south from Chicago, but not that far. Oh, yeah. You would, you, you would, nothing would go that far. It's possible. Maybe from here? No. Maybe. Well, no, maybe from not. Southern, but from southern Lake Michigan. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of the times, again, just sort of for... For fish, like any animal, energy is the currency that we speak in, right? So it's there's like trade-offs. So if you want to travel far, that's going to cost energy. But is it worth it to get to a particular spawning area that might be really good and um, and you'll have more offspring? So there's there's all these sort of trade-offs to think of in terms of like behavior of a fish. So I don't, I think this is an opportunity where we're learning. We're seeing fish move a lot more than what we would have anticipated. There's, there's more to be seen. This again, we're really pretty, like we're only really a decade into getting a lot of information. Uh, mostly we know more about walleye, but we've seen um, some carp that were taken in Toronto Harbor, um, moving like, you know, more than 100 kilometers. So um, there's a, a lot more that we have to learn. Yeah. Do these things uh, have to hold out in the wintertime? Nope, they're out year round. Depending on some locations, like anything, the majority is out year round. Okay, yeah. So, uh, no, and actually what's kind of neat is under the ice, it creates a quieter environment. So um, a fish could be even further away from a listening station and uh, it can be picked up from further away. You don't know that. Though. What's that? How far they are, you don't really know. Oh, the, the yes. Um, the newer listening stations that are being built are going to have something that will give us a better really? indication. Yeah, of how far away. We, what we do often is do a range test in the different areas. So we have an idea of, you know, what is the listening radius of a particular receiver, but it changes over the season. If you have one uh, in an area that gets a lot of aquatic plants, um, anything that gets in the way of that sound wave um, can mean that detection radius goes down. So um, in more shallower waters, uh, in the summertime, the detection radius might go down. Um, but in the wintertime, when there's no aquatic plants, that same receiver might be able to pick a tag up from further away. Um, it's really a line of sight technology. So do we have any questions no. online? Yeah. yeah. So is there a difference between the temperature permit for long nose and like such? It's not obvious yet. I think that there might be some habitat differences, but I'm kind of across the board uh, analyzing everybody together at the moment. 
uh, as well, because in some tributaries, you'll get both longnose and white suckers. And then some we do have that are very distinct white sucker tributaries versus longnose. I don't have enough of just longnose sucker trips to pull that, to know for sure, for sure. And each of the tributaries is kind of different too. I've got like teeny tiny ravine creeks to bigger urban rivers, like in Milwaukee, bigger agriculture rivers, nice, maybe more pristine protected, like um, Heinz Creek that has the land trust around it and all in between. But so far, so far haven't seen- How many did it Longitudinally, it's all about the same temperature. Yeah. Tracks, right? Yes. So you should not be able to have enough long doses. Treat those out. The difference between long doses and white stuff. Is that what you're saying? I might, maybe if I pulled them out and look at them separately. But really, Heinz Creek is my only long fully long nose sucker trip. But yeah. Uh -uh. Putting us to bed now. Peter's gone to sleep. How many were on Zoom? No, we had not ten. So we good. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Come to my talk at Fishtail.